Uh, we really appreciate Dr. Duvari can come back again after uh, last Monday's distinguished lecture on psychiatry changes. And uh, after we have presented uh, some uh, content about consciousness, and Dr. Duvari comes back today to wrap up his presentation. And we already introduced uh, Dr. Duvari last time, and he's an outstanding scholar. Uh, he received his B.S. degree from Caltech and Ph.D. from Stanford, then later M.D. from uh, UC San Diego. And uh, he is a renowned psychiatrist, and uh, he has his practice in the Bay Area right now. And uh, Dr. Duvari, it's our pleasure uh, to welcome you again. Uh, please get started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, and thanks for having me back. Um, so. Uh, what Ed wanted me to share this time is um, challenges related to COVID. Uh, I think the last time I'd done this was a couple of years ago when COVID just started and there was a lot of impact of COVID, a lot of unknowns actually uh, about what it would do uh, in, in society in general. Um, and so uh, I think it makes sense now two years later to revisit the topic see what we know uh, and sort of new and emerging questions that are coming up uh, because it looks like um, on the one hand there is uncertainty about how COVID will play out even two years later but on the other hand it's starting to seem like it's not really going away so um, I think it's important to start to understand how to think about that um, what are the questions coming up and um, and, and discuss uh, maybe how to deal with some of them. So, disclosures as before. And so this is a court I like to use, you know, there's a lot of challenges as a result of the pandemic, lots of deaths, as I'm sure you've heard, recent milestone of a million US deaths related to COVID. Um, and of course, there's other global issues so I like this quote because ultimately I think what we have to do um, in situations like this is figure out a way out of it uh, and make that the focus, which is really uh, what we're going to need to do with COVID as well. So I wanted to start with um, this recent graphic um, that I saw, um, which had to do with the impact of um, COVID on global mental health. and Basically, you know, two sides of the panel. On the left side, um, you look at anxiety and uh, depression. Um, and what I'm going to do is see if I can get a pointer here. There we go. So we have depression on the left side, anxiety on the right side, on the left panel. And the dark part of the bar graph tells you that these are additional cases that were added on estimated due to COVID, and this is cases in 2020. So that is a pretty big chunk, as you can see, um, 76 million here and 53 million here for um, depression. On the right side, it looks at the age distribution. And again, you're looking at additional uh, prevalence that was added on. A lot of the burden is on the early end. So maybe about halfway, 30s and below, and similar here, 30s, mid 30s and below. Um, and then um, on the bottom of the panel, um, there's the gender distribution, um, which is somewhat um, in sync with what you typically see, which is that uh, there's a female predominance as there is for the baseline cases as well. Um, so again, it's impact is significant in terms of at least a couple of common mental health problems. Um, let's see if I can advance the slide. And then this is sort of a, a global map to put that overlay on in terms of depression in particular, just to give you an idea. We talked about depression a little bit last time. Um, uh, and in this case, basically what you're seeing side of the panel, distribution across age, uh, among women on the right side, among men. Uh, and basically what they try to do is a way to find prevalence across age groups. Um, 
And these are pretty stunning numbers. One in three uh, women have depression by the age of 65, because that's the cutoff here. Um, and here about uh, one in five men. So very high. I mean, obviously there's corrections, et cetera, made in order to make sure the estimates make sense. Um, but super high numbers. And then you're seeing sort of this add-on effect due to COVID that we just um, discussed. So what is COVID actually looking like now, two years out? Um, this is um, starting with 2020 on the left side of the x-axis and the right side um, this week uh, in 2022. And basically, we're looking at daily cases on the left part of the y-axis. And the right part, we're looking at a seven-day average of death rate, which is deaths per 100,000. And... As you can see, the overall peaks of the deaths per 100,000 um, are actually in the same ballpark, somewhere between four and seven uh, deaths per 100,000. What's quite dramatically different is if you look at the cases, the daily cases, each bar is a daily case, um, and the red is the running average, um, you find that the prior peaks which you know hover somewhere end of the year again here end of the year in 2020 um the last peak dwarfs both the others that you see in this graph so that's a bit of a problem um, um so whatever variant we have or set of variants we have have managed to um break through all the prior history and raise a daily case number that is higher than we've seen before. Um, relative to that, I guess the good news is that the seven-day average in terms of deaths um, per 100,000 has remained in the same ballpark. So what's that, what that's telling you, of course, is that these are less lethal in terms of end result, uh, but the spread is really massive. Um, and then there's another uh, phenomenon emerging, which is if you look at uh, deaths under the age of 18, um, again, on the right y-axis, it's number of deaths. And then um, on the left side, it's percent of deaths due to what they call PIC. A lot of this data is from the CDC, reported to the CDC. So PIC is pneumonia, influenza, and COVID. So that's the bucket, combined bucket. Um, and then on the bottom, you see uh, the blue shaded part, which is COVID deaths. So if you were to say, okay, the red is a percent line that's catching everything in this category, um, what is the gap between that and COVID deaths? And for this most recent peak, um, or re rather both mo most recent peaks, uh, one uh, fall of 2021, and then now um, into 2022, um, you find that the COVID deaths are driving the new peaks um, in this pediatric category. So, and that was um, certainly not the case before, the deaths prior uh, since the start of the pandemic, this is 2019 to 2020, where the pandemic started. Um, if you were to just look at the surveillance data in terms of deaths, um, it didn't really break through uh, what they look at as the seasonal variation, the threshold that this set. So that's what the wavy black lines are. Those are thresholds set for um, seasonal variation. The, the lower line is a baseline and the top one is a threshold that says, hey, there's a epidemic. Um, so it didn't seem to break through much um, in the early part, all the way really into the end of 21. But then just about then, it has uh, made one peak here and the second peak here. So that's something that will need to be looked at because the trends that come from um, pediatric uh, infections and spikes are going to be different. Uh, the consequences are different. The syndromes that come about medically are different. Um, so I guess uh, time will tell what that looks like um, and what we can do to avoid it. 
Um, we talked about pediatric cases. Then the next side of the equation is um, the other end of the spectrum, which is the elderly. And if you were to look at the elderly, sorry about this. Um, there are uh, a couple of examples here that are interesting. So um, if you look at two countries, or in the case of Hong Kong, part of a country, um, uh, so New Zealand and Hong Kong, um, pretty high vaccination rates overall in the 90s, 90% uh, range, uh, but very different stories in terms of case fatality. So the case fatality is almost 5% here in Hong Kong. And then very, very little, 0.1% in New Zealand. And both were spared from the effect of COVID for quite some time, and then they got hit earlier in the year. Um, and it looks, and, and that's what you can see from the, from the red here, is that the fatalities really took off after March, whereas that didn't ha really happen for New Zealand, even though the top peak looks the same. You know, the cases have been building in both places. So one of the um, contributors, it seems here, is that 66% of the over 80-year-olds uh, were unvaccinated in Hong Kong. And uh, that was at the start of when the Omicron variant took off. And it looks like uh, that probably paid, played a big part uh, in creating the susceptibility to severe consequences, including, including death. So here is an example where, again, you know, maybe um, most of the population is doing okay, managing, um, despite case numbers increasing. But if you have a pocket of vulnerability, in this case, a significant one, um, uh, and due to lack of vaccination, then you can really have a pretty massive impact on the population. Um, another consequence of COVID uh, being in the picture has to do with long COVID. And this is increasingly becoming an issue where the number of people who are having long-term effects of COVID, uh, which is abbreviated, that, that syndrome is abbreviated as PASC, which is basically post-COVID uh, symptoms. Um, there's not been a lot of communication about long COVID officially. And that's what this article talks about um, is that public health messaging has been missing out on really talking about what happens when somebody doesn't have sense of taste and smell. What happens when people have recurring fatigue, uh, problems with breathing, problems with memory and concentration that persist well past the acute episode where they have COVID. Um, and uh, COVID has also been associated with clotting-related problems um, in the context of cardiovascular um, function. So the brain and the heart being the big targets of what your blood vessels supply. Um, so basically clots lead to strokes um, and heart failure. So that seems to be another set of sequelae that has come out of people who've been uh, impacted by COVID earlier sometime on the timeline. And so the two issues are one, there needs to be more public health messaging so that people recognize that this is an issue and people factor this into the risk evaluation about, hey, how much of a risk is COVID in general? Because if we only look at, you know, it's gonna inconvenience me for five days, okay, big deal. And if it's doing much to me, I'm fine. I'll go about my life and not really care. Now you factor in saying that, oh, you know, you're going to have a percent of these people. Um, we're going to have other symptoms that are prolonged. Well, that changes things a bit. And then the second part is what's going on here? What is the risk factor involved? What is a set of uh, consequences that we can really call long COVID versus something else? Because there's also overlap in terms of symptoms. So that study needs to be started. And the NIH has launched into it, but probably a little late. This article in JAMA um, actually um, starts to establish some of this data um, early on, but it's only um, 
now, as I said, that a lot of the study has been kicked in uh, in 2022 from the uh, NIH. So what the top panel shows you is days since you've had COVID. So 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, et cetera, intervals all the way up to almost a year on the right end. Um, and the, the peak in terms of uh, what they think of as symptoms or consequences of COVID past the acute episode is about half a year. So six months out, <clears throat> which is also a problem because in a way it's, it's not the first thing you think of six months out because you have other things going on in your life, presumably. Uh, and um, you're not, you know, you're not just going to immediately associate things that are coming up six months later as being um, somehow related to an event that occurred and maybe only lasted five or 10 days and maybe didn't even make much of an impression when you had the uh, acute COVID episode. And then on the bottom panel, this is percent of patients on the y-axis and we have four bars. So the darker bars of the different colors are mild cases and the lighter bars are the severe cases. So these are people who had either mild or severe COVID symptoms. Um, when you're starting off uh, monitoring. And basically it looks at each category and says, okay, well, how, how is that category playing out in these cases? So you have tall peaks in, which basically means close to 100% of patients have trouble breathing. And this is um, uh, in the severe illness, which makes sense uh, and mild, less so. Um, and then tall and short bars for cough, related. Uh, another one feeling feverish, again, makes sense. And then you have a whole host of other things, body aches, etc. And then now if you look at um, post-COVID symptoms, there's persistence of a lot of them in maybe up to about 20% of cases. So fatigue, which we talked about briefly. Um, so severe illness seems to have more fatigue than mild. Uh, about the same in terms of loss of taste of smell, um, taste or smell. Um, and again, pretty high percentage, just close to 20% of the cases. And then these are lower, maybe five to 10%, but still significant number when you're talking about millions. Um, there's cough, sore throat, uh, body aches, um, some people having sweats, chills or shivering. So not trivial. So how are we doing in terms of vaccination? You know, because if we, uh, uh, think that vaccines are going to help us get out of this situation. Um, we need to be able to get it out to everyone. Otherwise, um, we're not going to be able to um, shrink the pandemic. Um, so, so far, almost 260 million have gotten at least one dose. Um, fully vaccinated, 220 million, which is decent. But again, not a big chunk, only two thirds of the population. Um, and then smaller fractions still have received a booster. This is, of course, averages across the country, which has demographic and geographic differences. Um, so this gives you maybe slightly uh, uh, refined a picture of what that vaccination rate looks like. So if you look at fully vaxxed folks, this is all from the CDC. Um, and you say, okay, I'm going to look across the U.S. by state, uh, color-coded by percent. Now, the percent in this case is calculated for 12 and above, meaning that you can actually get a vaccine. Um, and as you can see, there's a couple of outliers that are quite low, 0 to 60% bucket. And then right next category, 60 to 70%, um, is uh, quite a few states. Probably have big rural components to them. Um, and, and then there's the rest, there's the West Coast, there's the East Coast, which is higher percentages. Um, so when you're talking about COVID and managing COVID, it's not as if you're managing a country that looks like one thing. It's a patchwork, which makes the management obviously much harder. Um, uh, at least if you wanna use a centralized plan, like some of the countries who've done a good job uh, have been able to do, and, and some of those countries are also a lot smaller. Um, the other part to think about here is this is for 12 plus. So it's a fair way to look at it because if you're gonna count how well you're doing, you wanna know that everyone you're counting can actually get a vaccine because you have a vaccine that's been approved. 
However, um, in reality, when it comes to the virus, the virus doesn't care. It's going to attack whoever is in front, whoever is accessible. So if you look at it from that perspective, you really want the number to reflect the total population, so including below 12. If you do that, the numbers uh, drop by about 8 percentage points if you look at the tables. So what that does is a couple of things. One, obviously, it drops the 0 to 60 bucket even lower in that range. So you know who knows what those numbers are for a couple of states. And then uh, the second part is now the next category, which is a lot of states. You know, it's three here, four, five, and then maybe about 15 total. Um, so 15 total states in this in this lighter color here um, that are in the 60 to 70 bucket. Now that drops into the zero to 60 bucket. So you're starting to have close to 20 states, a little less than half the, the number of states in the country that are in this lowest bucket. Um, if you count everyone. And so, and that's who the virus can access. So that's a bit of an issue. If you think that, you know, fully vaxxed is the target you want, then you got a problem. And so um, kind of speaks to one of the things that obviously can be improved. Um, another piece um, of the puzzle is, you know, there's been a lot of asymptomatic spread of the virus. Uh, since it started in 2020. Um, and um, so one way to measure that, because you're not going to be able to measure it by looking at symptoms, because by definition, it's, it's asymptomatic. So how do you know that somebody's already been exposed and that they've developed antibodies to the virus? Um, you can look at the antibodies. And that's what this study did. And basically, again, the data. Uh, that's been put together um, at the CDC shows that um, when you look at sets of individuals across the age groups, it is in fact the youngest, so 17 and below, um, and then 18 to 49 that have uh, very high percentages of antibodies. Um, basically painting the picture that a big chunk of the population, especially the younger ones, have already been exposed. And in theory, that should be a good thing. In theory, that should be a good thing because if you have antibodies, you're able to defend yourself against the virus. Um, and again, the bottom line, uh, the bottom uh, graph shows you a timeline um, where you have 2020 and 21, and then finally um, FAB 2022 uh, and beyond. This is the most recent. Um, on the right side, and there is a bit of a jump uh, in the trajectory of zero prevalence, uh, which is the presence of these antibodies to COVID. Um, and so it's, it could mirror what we've seen before, which is that the rapid spread is not only symptomatic, which is being measured and probably tested because people feel symptoms and then want to confirm whether it's COVID or not, um, but also asymptomatic. And Presumably, that number is even bigger, uh, and it's showing up in the antibody chart. Now, the question there with that antibody chart, of course, is um, what's leading to it? Uh, why are we getting these jumps in the percent uh, of positive antibodies for COVID in the population? And then what are the consequences? Do those people have to worry about long COVID. Um, so let's look at what's leading to this rapid spread. So these sets of um, figures here. So on the left side, you have a time range between Feb and May um, of this year. And basically what you're seeing is different colors representing different variants. So on the right side, there's a bit of a key so you have the lighter color here, which is BA2, um, BA2.12.1, which is the reddish one, which is taking over on the bottom. So the story unfolds that it used to be all BA1 or mostly BA1.1, along with uh, a bit of 529, which was another variant under Omicron. They got outcompeted by BA2. So the pink 
took over. And as the pink took over somewhere in April, we had another variant come up. Um, so somewhere around this time, starting about mid-March, you had four variants battling it out. And what it looks like is even though initially BA2 was winning, now we have BA2.12.1 uh, taking over about half the slots. So what this is telling you is that variants are picking up in terms of number. They are uh, winning or losing because of how infectious they are, how easily they can spread. And BA2.12.1 is so far the variant that can spread the most. Um, and it's more infectious than the prior version, which was several for infectious than the version before that of Omicron. And overall, it was known that when Omicron came on the scene, it was more infectious than, say, Delta. So um, it's starting to show you that um, for whatever reason, the evolution is speeding up. One of those reasons could be that, as you saw, there are spikes um, in the number of cases. So the more chances you have for the virus to mutate, um, the more it's going to take that chance, turn into something else, give us these different variants, and then there'll be a variant that succeeds at spreading. And it's going to evade our mechanisms to keep it in check, uh, both natural or vaccine-based. So then that poses the question of, okay, how do you solve this problem of new variants coming up? Do we really think it's a problem, even though you know we've seen the data of lots of cases, but maybe the, the death rate has stayed relatively the same? Another way to look at the same data is to then track these fractions of variant type across the US. And as you see on the West Coast, there's a lot more of the pink variant. Um, which from the prior graph, you can see is the BA2. And then the darker one, which is BA2.12.1, is starting to pick up on the East Coast. So there's maybe an East to West gradient here um, for whatever reason. Um, so that's the other thing because of the geographic and demographic differences across the country. Uh, you can't really treat it as one number in terms of the ratio between the variants. You have to look at it uh, by region and then figure out what the strategy needs to be if uh, managing this is a priority. So one of the questions that comes up is, well, we saw that data about um, antibodies being highly prevalent to COVID in the population. Um, giving the idea that, well, that should confer some amount of protection. Um, so how is it that um, you're not getting protection to the next variant that comes up? We've already learned in the past that newer variants have started to evolve ways in which they can evade the immune system. So people do studies where they look at um, antibodies that folks have to a prior infection, and then they ask, hey, how effective is this antibody at neutralizing this new variant? And what folks have found is that as each variant came along, notably Delta and then Omicron, and the subvariants, those subvariants were increasingly getting through. They were getting through the barriers posed by the prior um, antibodies to the virus, and maybe even the original virus. So what this study that came out recently, um, it was a rapid print, it hasn't officially been published. Um, it showed a few things. Um, so one, um, in, in this particular context that we just talked about, about evolving variants and protection from variants, um, could we have cross variant protection? And then that'll end the pandemic because you kind of build up these antibodies, they get better and better, and then it doesn't matter what virus does, you're good. Um, what they show here is that in blue, without vaccination, infection with Omicron induces a limited um, 
humoral immune response in mice and humans. They did studies in mice separately um, to kind of look at more mechanism and found that you need vaccination in order to make use of the prior um, infection um, so that there's kind of a boosting effect. Um, and part of the mechanism that they learned is that Omicron replicates only in low levels in the lung and brain, in the animal studies they did. And then when they found out that um, they took sera from the unvaccinated Omicron infected individuals um, and tested them because you know, you'd expect to have immunity as a result of that infection uh, based on our prior conversation. Um, they found that these Omicron infected individuals who were not vaccinated, they show a limited neutralization of Omicron. And that's a problem. So meaning you're not building immunity to Omicron. However, if you have breakthrough infections, meaning you've already been vaccinated, then you get a higher neutralization against all variants. So not just Omicron, also Delta and subvariants. So this seems to suggest a strategy where um, there's been this question out there that says, well, you know, we should be building up antibodies to these variants. If I did fine when I was exposed to the virus, life is good. I've, I've gotten my antibodies and I should be doing well. But that doesn't look like it's the case. It looks like, at least with Omicron, uh, if you don't have vaccination uh, in your system, then you're not able to mount a good antibody response, presumably because of something that the virus has been doing differently uh, in this variant. Um, and one of those things, as we alluded to, is that um, it only replicates to low levels, maybe as a strategy uh, to evade a big response. So again, the strategy suggested here from this paper seems to be, well, there seems to be this boosting effect of having a vaccine um, so that your, your immune system is more ready to tackle the impact of an Omicron infection, build a response that then protects you from other variants that we can test so far. Obviously, it remains an open question how that would play out with variants we haven't seen yet or haven't tested yet. Um, another question that has been coming up is, um, so we've had, if you look at the vaccine landscape, we had um, mRNA-based vaccines. Here you see a reference to BNT, right? Um, and so you have the um, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, which, which is named here. And then you have the Moderna vaccine, which are both mRNA-based vaccines um, deployed widely across the US. So the first two doses were part of the initial regimen. We reported on the data, we talked about the data in terms of how widely they've been accepted in the population. And then uh, there's been prior data about how effective they are, and they were you know, super effective in those uh, studies, uh, high 90%, mid to high 90% in terms of being effective um, um, to protect you against uh, bad outcomes from the, from the virus. Um, and even with new variants, when you got a booster, which was booster number one after two shots of the mRNA virus, that again did a great job um, with protecting us uh, based on the data. Um, and then there was this question of, okay, well, now we have a second booster. Is it worth it? And the second booster ostensibly was supposed to help with um, you know, variants that came after Delta including Omicron. And the early antibody studies didn't seem to support that taking that second booster was going to do a lot for the antibody response. So there was always this question mark about since that set of studies that, you know, is it really worth having that extra booster unless you're in a special category, like you're much older, you're immunocompromised, etc. Well, so this study here basically says that 
for at least a couple of variables, and they show some other variables as well, uh, for symptomatic infection, as well as hospitalizations, as well as other severe events, there's definitely a difference between the control group and the four-dose group. So the four-dose group is a group where you have two normal doses, just dose one and two, and then you have um, booster one and booster two that follow dose one and two. Um, and the question is, is it worth having that, that four dose combination? And it looks like it does separate uh, from the control group. Um, and so this paper basically um, studied the effect of it um, and uh, concluded that since um, um, if you compare folks who received a third dose at least four months earlier, but had not received a fourth, fourth dose, um, then you're going to do better than them uh, in this analysis. So that seems to suggest that um, the real world data does support getting uh, the second booster uh, in terms of uh, added effectiveness uh, for these various outcomes. Um, and there's a couple more outcomes they measured, and they were all um, uh, helpful in the, uh, they were all. Um, uh, helpful and showed this this positive uh, difference between the control group and the four dose group. Uh, Doctor, so, <coughs> Robert, uh, I have a quick question here. Yeah. So on the chart, if we look at the absolute number, uh, mm -hmm. it seems like the risk reduces maybe only about point. Very small. Yeah, very small. So compare with the risk. Right, you have side effects, and maybe I I heard people getting vaccination, they have severe consequences. Mm -hmm. So compare with risks, do you consider overall the booster is is worthwhile? So you know, I think that is definitely one of the contexts um, this was presented, uh, uh, and the context being okay, if you have folks who are in categories that fear each time, hey, we've got another variant coming in, maybe because they're immunocompromised for whatever reason, either innately or because they're in some kind of treatment. They're in an age category, which honestly starts about 50s. You know, it's not, you don't have to be 80 plus. It's 50 on is where the negative consequences, severe consequences of COVID start, start to rack up. Um, if you belong in those categories, then that's where I think this is the clearest uh, message, uh, is that for those folks, because that risk of severe outcome still exists, um, and, and there is this other issue of the waning of protection from vaccines uh, when you've gone, say, six months or greater, um, then it does create this window where it is, uh, sort of less risky to go the vaccine route than it is to take your chances and uh, not be protected from the severe uh, impact of COVID. Um, the, the other piece here, which I think I allude to later, is that over time with the newer variants, it seems like the gap in terms of the folks who are vaccinated and the folks who are not vaccinated is narrowing. So if you look at the people who are in hospitals, initially it was very clear cut. I mean, it was just night and day. Uh, you hardly found people who were vaccinated in that group and you basically everybody was either unvaccinated or just very adamant that they didn't wanna be vaccinated. Um, that is no longer the case. There are a lot of breakthrough infections. So, um, that also starts to play into this calculus. So um, obviously it's also related to what are the things you're doing day to day that will expose you. You know, if, if the only way you're gonna have a job is that you're gonna be in the public sphere um, and yes, you know, you'll do your thing to be careful and mask up and all that, um, it's still not going to be sufficient to kind of roll the dice. Uh, is my guess. Um, 
because these viruses are getting increasingly um, infectious. Uh, the, you know, the r naught is increasing. And uh, it didn't seem like that would happen in the early days. It didn't seem like that was a number we would reach, but we're there. Um, and it's, there's no law that just because the latest version of Omicron seems to have pretty reasonably mild um, uh, episodic illness and clinical course, that that has to remain the case. Um, and so there's sort of an individual risk factor analysis that one has to do based on your situation. And then there's sort of the more population-based one, which I think we're in the middle of because of this recent spike, um, which is bigger than the prior spikes. And the problem with that is now you're rolling the dice in a much more uh, intense way to say, okay, let's give the virus 10 times more chances to find new variants. And that's probably exactly what we shouldn't do. Um, because then maybe one of those hundreds of variants will be this combination of something that's at least as infectious and a lot more harmful. Um, so, um, and as we've seen, small percentages can have big numbers in absolute terms when the population at play is 300 plus million, at least just for the US. Um, so I, I think those are the things that need to be balanced, but at least at the, at the current time, the direction on the population side has been no mask, mask mandates. Um, and it does seem like mask use has gone down quite a bit, even voluntarily. Um, and then similarly, you know, lockdowns do not seem to be a thing, uh, given that people are experiencing mild symptoms, at least in the acute phase of their infection. So I think that's partly where the messaging of things like long COVID and the other data we have out there needs to be more effectively done. Mm -hmm. Because until then, people are not factoring the full risk um, you know, what good is it for someone to realize six months later that now they're stuck with long COVID? Um, I mean, sure, they may say the public health agencies didn't do a good job, but honestly, what, what good is that going to do? Um, so reducing the number of chances the virus gets to mutate and um, doing a better risk calculation or modifying how you go about your day is probably a more effective strategy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, your point stands that the, you know, we're dealing with small percentages, especially in the current peak with hospitalizations, mm -hmm. um, but maybe not for cases. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So given, given the way it's playing out and given what we know about variants, one of the things that's useful to do is have a little bit of predictive capability. And um, as a step you can take to say, okay, we can do a better job in terms of managing the pandemic. And one of those ways it turns out is actually doing surveillance of wastewater. Um, and it, it showed up as a signal early on. Um, and uh, fortunately, the, the US government has actually um, increased its surveillance across the US. Um, a lot of the gray dots are basically no data, um, whereas the colored ones are on the spectrum that you see, either negative change on a 15-day scale um, in terms of percent um, virus captured. And um, obviously the red is you know tenfold or more uh, increase. So it's a good, and it, it's about, apparently it seems to be about four to six days advance warning. So it can start to give people a bit of a heads up once you know they're educated about what that means and how should they potentially modify either school, work, home front, um, interactions and risk management. Another way to manage uh, the impact of the virus without clamping down what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, because people are definitely 
tired of lockdowns and tired of masking um, and, and sort of having to really contain the social aspect uh, of their lives. Um, it, so one way is to manage it um, in terms of air quality. Um, just like the, the US government put in a lot of work to ensure that water is clean because water quality matters for health. Um, this may be an opportunity to actually start to push uh, for air quality, especially in indoor settings. Um, and Joseph Allen has been one of these folks who's really been pushing on this in the, in the um, context of this pandemic. Interestingly, the White House actually put this out um, much to, I think, the, the delight of a lot of people in that sector of science and technology, where basically the opening statement was the most common way COVID-19 is transmitted from one person to another is through tiny airborne particles of the virus hanging in indoor air for minutes or hours after an infected person has been there. Very clear and basically starts to shape what you have to do. So you have to ventilate um, in any number of ways and you have to protect against uh, what is in the air, some of the strategies we talked about and some of the strategies that people haven't either invested or asked the government to invest in. And an example of that would be um, the variety of strategies that are out there to improve ventilation. Um, you know, in special situations for indoor settings, there are standards for ventilation. How many times the air needs to be exchanged? Classic example is operating rooms. They have super high exchange rates. You know, within minutes, the air is pumped in and out in special ways so that the, uh, so no bug can really hang around very long. Um, there's UV light that's um, used to kill bugs where there are bugs in the air. Um, there's temperature control because once you move that much air, uh, it, unless you have a special mechanism, uh, the temperature will start to mirror the outside air. So the so operating rooms and hospitals are really, you know, uh, built to do this sort of thing. But really, there ought to be other technological solutions, many of which we have access to, um, that uh, should be implemented in indoor spaces because otherwise it becomes a trap. The indoor space becomes a trap where aerosol-based spread becomes uh, not only possible, but likely. And uh, one of the advantages of tackling this um, particular way of solving uh, spread is that it's agnostic to what the exact variant is as agnostic to which version it is. It's to some degree also agnostic to whether you're vaccinated, you have a mask on or not. It's an independent layer that is protective no matter what. Obviously, if you add the other layers, vaccination, mask, et cetera, they're gonna add on to each other and give you better protection. But this is a standalone step that can help in indoor settings, um, which it seems like um, we have not yet gotten into on a national scale. Um, this is from the beginning of the pandemic and says what is probably obvious to most people, although um, there's been a lot of muddying of the message from some of the early public health announcements. Um, now, hopefully the message is loud and clear. This is an aerosol based process. And with an aerosol-based process, you have to protect against uh, the virus in the air. And the best way to do that is source control, which is what you see on the left side here. If you don't have the mask on, you're spewing out these particles. You really cut down on that quite effectively, even with a basic surgical three-layer mask. And obviously much more so if it's an N95. And then similarly, to add to that in terms of layers, if you have a mask on, yes, it protects you somewhat with a surgical mask. But uh, if the person who's the source wears a mask, then you're in really good shape if you have a mask on as well. And that's if both of you only have surgical masks. 
obviously much better if you're in that space for a longer time, it's a confined space, if both have N95s. So that's the risk assessment. And you almost have to think about it as if you're using one of these virus counters, you know, um, uh, almost like how people measure radioactivity. They just kind of keep counting each time there's a radioactive hit. And you say, okay, what's my dose exposure? So you have to think about the virus in that way. How much time am I spending in an environment where there's likely to be exposure? And the longer the time you're going to spend there, uh, it's more important that um, both sides of the equation, the person who's a potential spread con risk and the potential um, recipient of a virus are both masked and they are using um, higher quality masks. This is uh, from the um, about 100 years ago when they had the uh, uh, terrible pandemic with influenza, um, where again, it was the same message. Uh, obviously that part of the equation hasn't changed uh, is that people understand masks are useful. Um, it's just been difficult to keep that as an ongoing priority. Over time, uh, there have been all kinds of, you know, popular and political and other messages about, you know, COVID's just going to go away or it's going to get milder or something else. So we don't really have to worry about it. We'll do a few vaccines and then we're done. So now that we've had these two vaccine doses for the mRNA vaccines and we have a couple of boosters, okay, that should be it. You know, it'll fizzle out. We don't need lockdowns. We don't really need to do much else. This viewpoint um, argues that, look, um, this is not how this pandemic is going to end. Um, and as this paragraph says, a major misconception is that the vaccines are holding steady to protect against severe disease, hospitalization, and deaths. They are not. When a booster was given during the Delta wave, which is the prior uh, variant, it fully restored protection against these outcomes to the level of 95% effectiveness. But for Omicron, which is the current set of variants, with a booster or second booster, the protection is approximately 80%. So this is high, but it still represents a major fourfold lack of effectiveness um, uh, uh, drop down. So So if you were to extrapolate from that, then the problem is um, with each variant, you're going to get that drop even with our best tools out there. Um, so we cannot count on a passive strategy where we are vaccinating people and then just kind of do our thing uh, and let, you know, the surges happen like the recent one that we uh, looked at on the graph. Because then you're exposing the virus to these um, tens of folds of opportunities to create more variants and then you have to deal with that and the impact of that and it's almost as if you're you're playing out that story all over again so what can you do um at least on the vaccine side um one of the solutions could be uh, a vaccine uh, that is intranasal um so this is uh from uh, one of the scientists working on uh vaccines and immunity um so a nasal vaccine ideally could enter the mucus layer inside the nose and help the body make antibodies that capture the virus before it even has a chance to attach to people's cells. So really protective, right? Um, a lot of the current vaccines are not doing that. They're keeping you from getting sick, but you still get infected. This type of immunity is known as sterilizing immunity, which would be great. These kinds of vaccines have traditionally been considered difficult to make. The mucus layer is a formidable barrier. The body also doesn't generate a robust immune response by simply spraying any conventional vaccine up the nose. You've got flu mist, uh, which uses weakened viruses. That would be a problem if you have immunocompromised people. So what can you do? The good news is that scientists like myself, in this case, Kawasaki, believe we have found a way around this problem for SARS-CoV-2. Um, Animal studies show that uh, if you can spray the virus's spike protein into the nose in a host who's been vaccinated, um, 
you can then significantly reduce infection in the nose and lungs, and then that provides protection the disease. So there may be a path forward. So this is starting to paint the picture that, okay, maybe there are strategies we have to put in place. We've talked about a few of them, uh, but on the vaccine front, it may be time to start changing tack uh, from the traditional um, version where you, know, you get an intramuscular shot that then goes all around your body. Uh, but here uh, we really ought to focus on even giving the virus a chance to enter uh, your body, uh, put up roots so that um, it doesn't get a chance to mutate. And then ultimately by having fewer variants and better uh, ways to protect against an existing set of variants, uh, it should be possible um, to uh, cut down, limit, or, and maybe even eliminate um, what uh, SARS presents us with. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is really a, a edifying and a very nice talk. And uh, let's open to the, the class and uh, questions. You can directly speak to uh, Zoom or you can just speak up. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, you had mentioned the long term effects of COVID. Um, I was wondering what the variation is among different variants of COVID and how the boosters help with the long term effects in different variants of COVID. Yeah, can you hear the question, Duval? I, I heard, um, so it's about long COVID, and what I didn't catch is um, variation in long COVID across variants. Was that the question? Variations in like symptoms, or not symptoms, or, or the long term effects. Yes, variations. Um, we switch back to variations. variations, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a problem, right? So that that that's... That's definitely a question we should have some information on. Um, the kind of data we have at this point is, you know, survey data that says, okay, we look at a bunch of people who have uh, COVID, we follow them, we see what percentage gets COVID, doesn't get COVID, or maybe it's retrospective. So a lot of grouping, sometimes you have genotyping information, so you might be able to say this variant or that variant is contributing. Um, if we were to look at the data that's out there, which is done by various groups across the country, not some central government coordinated effort, basically whether you have a mild case of COVID, whether you have severe COVID, and whatever phase you have COVID in, you seem to be able to get long COVID. So, so far, there isn't a subset of getting the infection in, in either a certain intensity or a certain variant that's either good or bad as far as we know but that's also i think quite related to this issue that the the nih being kind of the main federal agency and and maybe other agencies haven't really put a lot of uh, effort and money into studying long COVID. it's it's literally just got going i think earlier this year so I think we'll find out more. There was a study that started to look at um, actually using AI. I was thinking about putting that slide in. I, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to include it. Um, there's a study that, I, and I don't know how much they have in the way of results, but um, quite a large study that is starting to crunch through data and say, okay, well, um, COVID-19 is hard to study because long COVID especially is hard to study because there's a lot of mimicking of symptoms across other illnesses. So how about we use AI because we got tons of people who've been infected with all kinds of things. So let's let's throw that in the pot and see if you can start separating things into categories based on you know templates and matching that we train it on. Um, and um, you know again, I, I haven't heard like big announcements from that, but it does look like they're starting to identify some factors. So but again, to your question, I don't know if I don't know if anything good or bad that creates a connection. Um, and to me, the bad part of that is it seems like so far 
the long COVID risk seems steady. Um, there, I think there was one study that looked at whether you were vaccinated or not at the point of infection. And that did seem to show uh, that if you were vaccinated, then you were less likely to have um, basically long COVID. Uh, uh, not, not protective, but less you know, less likely, significantly different from the other category. So maybe that's the one data point you can take home. Okay, so so for, for long COVID, uh, perhaps we also need to wait for more more data to uh, to come up. Uh, but one related question I have is the vaccine itself, right? Uh, mRNA vaccine. We don't know whether uh, the vaccine itself has long term side effect or not. Do, do you think there's a potential having long term side effect, or we just uh, maybe worry people worry too much? I mean, I think the question is, do we have a plausible mechanism of how that would be? Um, so, um, you know, one of the concerns early on, very early on, because even the concept of an mRNA vaccine was novel, first in human, really. Um, so at that point, the big concern for many people was, this is a nucleic acid. This is genetic material that's going in that you are voluntarily putting into your body. What if it goes and hangs out and then gets into your DNA and now you've got a problem? Um, I guess the answer on the face of it is that, of course, they haven't seen evidence for this, but maybe if you look at mechanistically how this might or might not happen, it's RNA, not DNA. So in order for this to be integrated, we would need DNA. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're putting in. We're putting in RNA, right? Messenger RNA specifically. Mm -hmm. RNA is very unstable in general and specifically in cellular environments. A lot of the things that actually had to be done to make the vaccine work mm -hmm. at all had mm -hmm. to do with stabilizing the RNA so that it can survive long enough to enter a cell replicate with the specific machinery that we have in our cells. And then once it makes the proteins, then the active ingredient of the vaccine is actually the protein, uh, which basically is from a virus, so foreign to us, and basically um, annoys our immune system into doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And it's that immune response that then ultimately protects us uh, when an actual virus comes in. So based on that mechanism, certainly there isn't an immediately plausible mechanism to integrate this protein-based therapeutic um, into the genome. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, does that mean the mRNA cannot have some other function where it's creating problems? I mean, I think that's where time will tell. Um, because, you know, mRNAs have all kinds of other functions other than just making proteins. So, um, uh, so time will tell whether that's a plausible cross-reacting mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess, I don't know if it's comforting, that should be a short-term thing. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of that has to do with processing of proteins being made. So maybe, you know, you get a swelling there. You get... And people certainly have had reactions. So it could explain how some people have local reactions that are worse than others. And so, um, but maybe that's more comforting to people because it's temporary, even if it were to be. And that would be similar maybe to having a protein-based thing that you inject directly, like some traditional approaches. Um, and then, you know, again, with questions like this, you always want to ask, What's the alternative, right? Because your, your risk is always relative to something. Mm -hmm. So the something could be, oh, we don't have an effective vaccine. Okay, well, that's definitely a problem. Um, or we have vaccines, but we have vaccines that are old fashioned, like inactivated whole virus vaccines. And I think there's some room for that. So it, in fact, I think there's some data that suggests that potentially combining mRNA along with whole vaccine versions 
could actually confer sort of a more, you know, it's not an exact term, but well-rounded protection. Uh, because um, this vaccine is hyper-targeted. So which means if the problems of the new variants are outside the targeted area, mm. you won't be generating protection to that. Whereas if you have, you know, a virus that has all the different parts in it that you're generating a response to as a backup part, then now I think you may end up with better immunity. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think there's time will tell. Thank you. So, if uh, you folks do not have question, I have another final question. Any? Okay. So, my final question is about this uh, mutation. We know the perhaps the probability of having a mutation is fixed. Let's say one out of one million. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, if we have a larger base, right? Suppose we have mm -hmm. one, million, one million people infected and we get one mutation. But we have uh, 1 billion infected, and we have much more. So yeah. we understand the situation. So the more people get infected, there is a higher probability we can see a new kind of mutations. The, the question is, uh, will the new uh, mutations be more le lethal than the original uh, virus? So for, from the experience of flu, right? Uh, flu is going on every year, and we have a large number of uh, populations getting flu. Mm -hmm. But the flu uh, symptoms or the, the fatal ratio seems to stay the same. And is there a scientific kind of uh, evidence or argument to consider a new variant would be less lethal or just this is just totally random? Yeah, it is random because each time it's a, it's a roll of the dice. Okay. Um, Obviously, it's not a roll of the dice from the beginning. It's a roll of the dice from the last step. Mm -hmm. So it's like one of those simulations you do where at each decision point, you're rolling the dice, and then you have that history, but then everything else is open. Um, and so in this case, we already have something that's very infectious. So it could get less infectious, but probably that will get outcompeted by something that is more infectious out of the hundreds of things that will crop up. And then similarly in lethality, you have that range. Mm. If it's too lethal, it will probably get out competed. That's the good news, but that's not before you kill a bunch of people. Mm. Uh, that's the problem is that sure, uh, naturalistically, that virus will not last very long um, uh, because it's not great for spreading if you kill people and do it quickly. Um, so there are other variables too, there's latency. So the longer it takes for something to kick in, that's worse for us, mm -hmm. because that means that virus is gonna win. Right. Um, and then, you know, there, there's other factors sort of like, you know, how long is it before somebody's sick? So if you have a carrier status, silent phase. So again, you know, this is, there's a lot of variables, unfortunately, <laughs> that the virus can play with. So, um, so given all of that, I think the real target is don't give the virus so many chances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, on, on a very long time scale, I think, you know, that's why people talk about the flu, things apparently settle down, but that's not something deterministic. Uh, that's probably the end result of sort of exhausting the possibilities in some sense. Uh, and also maybe because there have been so many exposures over now a hundred years, that has some impact on it too. But we're working on a timescale that's two years long. You, I, I don't know that you can extrapolate um, from the long timescale to our very short one. Okay. I uh, really appreciate your insightful uh, talk on this uh, topic. And uh, we know there are different countries having different policies. And uh, recently, China really want to insist having zero cases. Uh, but it seems like every strategy has their pros and cons, right? We have to just respect the uh, regional decisions. So thanks a lot, Dr. Duvari. And uh, uh, we uh, see you next time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yes. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.